ክቡር ፕሬዚዳንት ክቡራን ያለም በተሰብ መሪዎችና እንደራዚዎች ክቡርነቱ ማህበሩ የተመሰረተበትን ሀምስተኛውን አመተ ምህረት ቆንባቸው ግዚያት ይገኛሉ ሁለተኛው ያለም ጦርነት ያደረሰው ታላቅ ማመሳቀልና ጥፋት ለተባበሩት መንግስታት ድርጅት መሰረት መሰረት ምክንያት መሆኑ አሁን ተጠቅስናቸው ሁናቲዎች የሚቆጠር ሆኖ እናያለን የተባበሩት መንግስታት ድርጅት የተመሰረተበት 25ኛው ዓመት ለማክበር ዛሬ በዚህ ስፍራ ተሰብስበን የምንገኝ በጊዜ ነዋሪ ሆነው የሰውን የተፈጠሩ ጠባይ ለዚህም ድርጅት መወለድ ምክንያት የሆኑትን የታሪክ ሁኔታዎች ከሐሳባችን እንዳይለይ የሚገባ ነው ይሄንንም ማለት የሚያስደፍረን ልዩ ልዩ ምክንያቶች አሉ ከቅርብ ጊዜ ጀምሮ የተባበሩት መንግስታት አጣራጣሪና የማስተማመን ድርጅት ሆኗል እስካሁን በካናውነውም ሲመዘን አሁን በሚንገኝበት ዓለም ያሉትን ብዙ ችግሮች ለማስወገድ ሲዋለው ችሎታ ተስፋ የተደረገበትን ሳህል የተደከመ ይሄደ ነው አንዳንዶቹ የካልኪዳን ድንጋይ ወለውን የቀድሞውን የመንግስታት ማህበር ስናስታውስ የካልኪዳን ድንጋጊዎች በሚገባ በሥራ ላይ በመዋል ስለ ዓለም ጸጥታ መጠበቅ ብዙ እንዲያከናውን ይችል የነበረው ያ የመንግስታት ማህበር የመጀመሪያውን ጠንካራ የፈተና ትግል ያስሸንፍ ባለመቻሉ ያለፈት መቀበሩ አፋጠና የብር ይዮብሊዮን ለማከር በዛሬው ሁለት እዚ ተሰብስበ የተሰበሰብንለት የተባበሩት መንግስታት ድርጅት ባንድቱ እድሚ በሚያስደስት አድጎ የጎለመሰ ነው ትላላቅ ተግባር ያልተከናወነበት የድሚ ርዝማኒ መካን ሆኖ የተራቀተ መኖር ብቻ የማይለይ ቢሆንም የተባበሩት መንግስታት ቀደም ብሎ ተከሰናል የሚቻለውን ተተው በሐሳብ ብቻ ለማዋለድ ለጻነት ያልተሰጣቸው ሰዎች የካርኪዳን መንፈስ ጸንሰው አረቀቁ የነዚህም ሰዎች ተግባር ግቦችና አላማዎች ያሉትና በሰላም ላይ እንዲውል የሚችል ጽሁፍ ማሰናዳት ነበር ከተሳሰበው ንግግር አሰላጊዎች Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, distinguished chiefs of state and heads of government, your excellencies, the foreign ministers and delegates here assembled. I am honored to greet the members of the United Nations on behalf of the United States as we celebrate this organization's 25th anniversary. And on this historic occasion, I wish to pay a special tribute to the founders of the United Nations. to secretary general yutan and to all others who have played indispensable roles in its success in considering an anniversary and in celebrating one of this world and especially where the nuclear powers are involved such policies invite the risk of confrontations and could spell disaster for all 
the changes in the world since World War II have made more compelling than ever the central idea behind the United Nations, that individual nations must be ready at last to take a farsighted and a generous view. The profoundest national interest of our time for every nation is not immediate gain, but the preservation of peace. One of the reasons the world had such high hopes for the United Nations at the time of its founding was that the United States and the Soviet Union had fought together as allies in World War II. We cooperated in bringing the UN into being. There were hopes that this cooperation would continue. It did not continue. And much of the world's and the UN's most grievous troubles since have stemmed from that fact of history. It's not my intention to point fingers of blame, but simply to discuss the facts of international life as they are. We all must recognize the challenge that must be overcome. Despite the deep differences between ourselves and the Soviet Union, there are four great factors that provide a basis for a common interest in working together to contain and to reduce those differences. The first of these factors is at once the most important and the most obvious. Neither of us wants a nuclear exchange that would cost the lives of tens of millions of people. Thus, we have a powerful common interest in avoiding a nuclear confrontation. The second of these factors is the enormous cost of arms. Certainly, we both should welcome the opportunity to reduce the burden, to use our resources for building rather than destroy. The third factor is that we both are major industrial powers, which at present have very little trade or commercial contact with one another. It would clearly be in the economic self-interest of each of us if world conditions would permit us to increase trade and contact between us. The fourth factor is the global challenge of economic and social development. The pressing economic and social needs around the world can give our competition a creative direction. Thus, in these four matters, we have substantial mutual incentives to find ways of working together despite our continuing difference of views on other matters. It was in this spirit that I announced in taking office that the policy of the United States would be to move from an era of confrontation to one of negotiation. This is the spirit that we hope will dominate the talks between our two countries on the limitation of strategic arms. There is no greater contribution which the United States and the Soviet Union together could make than to limit the world's capacity for self-destruction. This would reduce the danger of war, and it would enable us to devote more of our resources, abroad as well as at home, to assisting in the constructive works of economic and development and in peaceful progress. In Africa, for example, where so many nations have gained independence and dignity during the life of the United Nations. In Asia, with its rich diversity of cultures and peoples. And in Latin America, where the United States has special bonds of friendship and cooperation. Despite our many differences, lack of confrontation with disastrous consequences for the Middle East, for our nations, and for the whole world. Therefore, we urge the continuation of the ceasefire and the creation of confidence in which peace efforts can go forward. In the world today, we are at a crossroads. We can follow the old way, playing the traditional game of international relations, but at ever increasing risk. Everyone will lose, no one will gain. Or we can take a new road, I invite the leaders of the Soviet Union to join us in taking that new road, to join in a peaceful competition, not in the accumulation of arms, but in the dissemination of progress, not in the building of missiles, but in waging a winning war against hunger and disease and human misery in our own countries and around the globe. Let us compete in elevating the human spirit, in fostering respect for law among nations, in promoting the works of peace. In this kind of competition, no one loses and everyone gains. Here at the United Nations, there are many matters of major and immediate global concern in which nations, even when they are competitors, have a mutual interest in working together as part of the community of nations. 
in approaching these matters, each of us represented here in our national interest as leaders and in our self-interest as human beings must take into consideration a broader element, the world interest. It is in the world interest to avoid the Christ for a continuing for the United States and the United Nations, all nations, not to be paralyzed in its most important function, that of keeping the peace. Disagreements between the major powers in the past have contributed to this paralysis. The United States will do everything it can to help develop and strengthen the practical means that will enable the United Nations to move decisively to keep the peace. This means strengthening both its capacity for peacemaking settling disputes before they lead to armed conflict, and its capacity for peacekeeping, continuing and ending conflicts that are broken out. It is in the world interest that we cooperate, all of us, in preserving and restoring our natural environment. Pollution now to set up rules and institutions to ensure that these resources are developed for the benefit of all mankind, and that the resources derived from them are shared equitably. But this moment is fleeting. If we fail to seize it, storm and strife could become both the responsibility and the means to help nations control the population explosion which so impedes meaningful economic growth. Human and economic waste. This scourge of drugs can be eliminated through international cooperation. I urge all governments to support the recent recommendation of the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs to take the first step toward giving them substance by establishing a United Nations, which we intend to protect. But we can, with complete honesty, say that we maintain our strength to keep the peace, not to threaten the peace. The power of the United States will be used to defend freedom, never to destroy freedom. What we seek is not a Pax Americana, not an American century, but rather a structure of stability and progress that will enable each nation, large and small, to chart its own course, to make its own way, without outside interference, without intimidation, without domination by ourselves or any other nation. The United States fully understands and respects the policy of non-alignment, and we welcome joint efforts such as the recent meeting in Lusaka to further international cooperation. We seek good relations with all the people of the world. We respect the right of each people to choose its own way. We do hold certain principles to be universal. As the United Nations begins its next quarter century, it does so richer in experience sobered in its understanding of what it can do and what it cannot, what should be expected and what should not. In the spirit of this 25th anniversary, the United States will go the extra mile in doing our part toward making the UN succeed. We look forward to working together, working together with all nations represented here in going beyond the mere containment of crises to building a structure of peace that promotes justice as well as assuring stability, that will last because all have a stake in its lasting. I remember very vividly today my visit to India in 1953, when I met for the first time one of the world's greatest statesmen, Prime Minister Nehru. I asked him as he considered that great country with its enormous power. What was its greatest need? He replied, the greatest need for India and for any newly independent country is for 25 years of peace, a generation of peace. In Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in Western Europe, in Eastern Europe, 
in all the 74 nations I have now visited, one thing I have found is that whatever their differences in race or religion or political systems, whatever their customs, whatever their condition, the people of the world want peace. So let the guns fall silent and stay silent. In Southeast Asia, let us agree to a ceasefire and negotiate a peace. In the Middle East, let us hold to the ceasefire and build a peace. Through arms control agreements, let us invest our resources in the development that nourishes peace. Across this planet, let us attack the ills that threaten peace in the untapped oceans of water and space. Let us harvest in peace. In our personal relations and in our international relations, let us display the mutual respect that fosters peace. Above all, let us as leaders of the world reflect actions what our own people feel. Let us do what our own people need let us consider the world interest, the people's interest in all that we do. Since the birth of the United Nations, for the first time in this century, the world's people have lived through 25 years without a world war. Let us resolve together that the second quarter century of the United Nations shall offer the world what its people yearn for and what they deserve, a world without any war, a full generation of peace.